Hello. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about making an Apple III arcade game. So that is that is the plan. Uh, the Apple III is uh, sort of like a supercharged Apple II. It's it has various kinds of improvements. Uh, it has more RAM, 128k to 256k, or even 512k uh, if you used a third-party uh, RAM enhancement. It runs at two megahertz. Uh, it has a built-in serial port which you can use for, uh, and you can use a, a silent type uh, printer built in. It has RGB output, it has six bit audio, it has a clock nearly built in, uh, custom text character sets, built in disk drive and chainable others, better keyboard, numeric keypad, 80 columns, lowercase, new graphics modes, and an emulation mode for Apple IIs. Uh, last year I talked about the emulation mode. So the um, the thing about the Apple II or the Apple III is that, um, it seems like it'd be pretty great for writing games. It has a lot of actually new sophisticated stuff. So it has interrupts, a nice interrupt system, uh, vertical blanking and more. Uh, it has a thing called smooth scrolling that I will talk a bit about, hard scrolling and hardware, uh, six bit uh, audio. It, it has yeah, 1.4 megahertz speed is actually a little bit closer to the, the actual speed. We'll talk more about that. Uh, and uh, you know more memory, it has this ability to move the zero page in the stack. Uh, it has customizable text fonts, which means that you can basically make sprites out of text. And it has a bunch of new graphics modes. So 140 by 192, 16 color high res. That's the, that's the sort of flagship mode. There's also a 560 by 192 black and white only super high res mode and a uh, color text mode. So um, seems like it would be pretty great for writing games. Uh, but there are only a very few uh, games available for it. So basically there are, there's Atomic Defense, uh, which is a like missile command game. And I don't actually know even if this was released. It's it's kind of like, uh, might have been Apple internal for all I know. Uh, it was written by Andy Hertzfeld. Uh, and it, it actually kind of, in a sense, has the same goal that I have today in that it's it's kind of a tech demo. Um, it's showing a bunch of stuff like the smooth scrolling and that kind of thing. Um, and actually, uh, Rob Justice did a disassembly of it, which was very useful in getting started in this project that I'm doing. Um, another another um, uh, game is Sandman, uh, which is a Pac-Man clone, clone that was, um, I think that was released by On3. Uh, but it's written by Melvin Astrahan. And, you know, so essentially it's, you know, it's a Pac-Man game. And it really looks quite smooth um, when you see it running. But anyway, uh, there really aren't many. Um, now, one of the primary things that the, or one of the things that people talk about with the Apple III is that it has a character set in RAM. So you can customize the fonts. Um, and what that means is that you can animate things really, really fast. You can change 56 pixels with a single write to memory um, because it's an entire, you know, the entire character goes in at once. So you could get an entire horizontal 280 by 8 band down with 40 writes, you know, so that that gives you some uh, sort of quick animation options. Uh, and, you know, the the um, on off colors, you know, so basically when you have a, a foreground and a background color for all 56 pixels can be set with a single write. So you can change the colors also very quickly if you're using the, the color text. Uh, so you could even write passable games in Business Basic. They're just text games. And there are a couple of these. So um, Captain Magneto is uh, maybe one of the more famous ones because that actually got a Mac port uh, later. But uh, it was originally on the Apple III by Al Evans. And it Basically, it's it's kind of Ultima style in a way. You you run around a, a text map, and you have a little character, and so forth. Um, there's uh, Apple Chomp. I think I, I I'm not sure actually what the source of this is. I think that was on one of the Washington Apple Pie discs, but uh, that's a little Pac-Man game. Okay, so here's the plan. Um, I I thought well, so the the deadline for uh, session submissions this year came up, and I thought well, I should really submit something. Uh, and I should even do something about the Apple III because like who else is gonna? So I said, all right, well, um, I know the Apple III can do all these fancy things and nobody's used them and I would like to know how to use them. And I, you know, I 
think it could work out pretty well. So I will write an arcade game in assembly language using the new graphics modes and enhanced features and so forth. That's the plan. Uh, of course, I hadn't written anything in assembly language on the Apple III before, um, and I hadn't written any arcade games. <laughs> uh, and I didn't actually really know how any of the graphics modes or enhanced features of the Apple III work. Uh, so this was a nearly foolproof plan. Okay, so first step, what kind of game would actually make use of the things that I have available? What I want, I want to demo the tech, what could do that? So um, what I ended up with is something where that would split the screen in two regions. So uh, that way we that way I could use multiple um, graphics modes at once. And, and I'll talk about how the screen splitting could work. But you know, so one mode would be in a band near the top, and next mode would be another band a little bit lower, and so forth. That would allow me to use all these these um, new graphics modes. Um, the and I want to, I want some sort of vertical scrolling to happen so I can use this smooth scrolling. Um, That'll be something that, you know, it can move things much faster than if they had to be drawn. And I want to use some custom character sets to, to uh, you know, fake fast graphics. And I want to use the uh, audio DAC for effects. Um, so what I settled on was a kind of a game. Uh, I ended up calling it Disc Hero. Don't know. Not sure it's a great game, but um, uh, uh, the idea is that there's a, a map and it has walls in, in it and scattered around in the map are disks. There are disks of varying uh, values. There are four different four different types of disk. And uh, the your goal is basically to go around and collect them, right? Um, so the idea is, I, I would, I, somewhere in I even made a little uh, like flux image icon and stuff, but I didn't end up using it in the game I produced. But uh, anyway, the idea is you're, you're going on, you're trying to you know exhaustively image the disks. Um, you're not under any direct threat from anyone in the game, and you're not actually trying to eliminate anyone in the game. You're just trying to collect things. And you're, the antagonists in the games are the hoarders. And so what they do is they run around and they grab the disks. And uh, once they have grabbed them, you can no longer get them. <laughs> Right, so, um, so the uh, that's the the basic uh, idea, and it has a sort of a dung beetles like vibe to it. So there's a big map in the background; it'll scroll around. You still can't see all of it at once, but you know, so it'll scroll vertically. You can see all of it horizontally, and then there's kind of a zoomed in section in the middle, and that's sort of where the play field action happens. Um, and so the and so that the zoomed in part is going to be the text mode part. The map in the background is going to be this the high res that scrolls and there's color text all around and uh, at the very top i've got uh, i had i have a um super high res you know black and white band at the top i didn't know what to do with that so it just makes little splashes whenever the numbers change in the the disk inventory uh okay so that's that's the game um here is a main screenshot of the game. And actually, I can now pull that over. Here is MAME uh, Actual. So uh, so here it is. It's It scrolls around. Um, you can see the, the numbers increase. You can drive around uh, picking up disks. The hoarders will also be trying to get these disks. And um, you can, one thing that you can see is that it scrolls uh, faster than you would expect on a 6502 of this sort, right? So. Um, I should also might also point out here that the uh, colors in MAME actually look quite a bit different um, from what we see on an actual uh, Apple III. So I've got the screenshot of MAME to the left there, and and the uh, actual Apple III Plus running this on the right, and you can see that it um, uh, the the colors are better on the real Apple III, uh, and uh, but they're also different on the real Apple III. So like the little disc hero label up at the top is actually almost unreadable on the on the real Apple III. Um, but anyway, so this is, uh, that's that's the game that we're building here. Uh, okay, so now the, uh, so the, the way this is going to, the way this is set up is that there are these bands and each band uh, has a different display mode. So the very top one shows the, um, the, the splash uh, effect when the inventory changes. Uh, then there's a text region that shows the score, um, high-res regions that show a um, portion of a larger map that scroll, scrolls. The text play field has custom characters that are used as sprites, and uh, I never quite figured out what to do with the the uh, medium resolution thing at the bottom. So if you look at the 
screenshot. I've just put like grass down there. Um, okay. Uh, now let me talk a little bit about screen splitting and you know how that's supposed to work. So one of the uh, earliest things that I ever encountered with the Apple II was this article in Soft Talk um, by Bob Bishop called "Have an Apple Split." Um, it's a really great article. You should read it if you haven't. But so what it essentially it talks about, you know, it sort of leads off by saying, if you read the Apple II manual, it says, you know, you, here are your graphics modes options. Uh, the only thing, the only one, these are the only ones that you have. Uh, one of them is you can have graphics at the top and a little text mode at the bottom. Otherwise you can have like high res or low res or whatever. And um, the premise of this is to basically say, well, um, if you think about how the, the sort of actual hardware of the screen drawing works, the the this picture is drawn uh, by a beam that goes you know across the screen, then back to the left, and then across the screen and across the screen, each for every line. Uh, then it gets to the bottom of the screen, and then it has to go back up to the top. And so there's this little period of time when nothing is being drawn to the screen. So it draws a line, and then there's a then there's nothing happening on the screen as it returns to the other to the original side, draws draws draws, and then when it gets to the bottom. Nothing is being drawn while the beam uh, gets moves back up to the top to start again. And so these are the blanking intervals. And so uh, the horizontal blanking interval is one where uh, the, the beam is going back horizontally to start the next line. And the vertical blanking interval is when the beam is getting going from the bottom back up to the top. Uh, what the Apple III provides um, is actual interrupts. Uh, so here I have a little picture of how the how the blanking is supposed to work. Um, and so we know we know how long everything is. It takes uh, 40 cycles to draw a line. Uh, and the so that, that basically corresponds to uh, one column per line. So either, either one text character or one group of seven uh, high-res pixels. Then it takes 25 cycles to do a horizontal blank. So there's 65 cycles per um, line. And then there are the equivalent of 70 lines of drawing time to get back from the bottom up to the top. The vertical, vertical blank is 70 lines worth. So on an Apple II at one megahertz, that's 4,550 cycles. So we can do this. On an Apple II, we don't have any signal of when the v, VBL is, but we uh, we do on the Apple III. The Apple III has interrupts, a fairly sophisticated interrupt system. And in fact, it also has horizontal blanking interrupts. So this is going to be great. This is going to be easy. Um, okay, so the way all this stuff works um, is that uh, it's a lot of this stuff is controlled by two uh, versatile interface adapter chips, 6522 vias. Uh, they deal with most of the interrupts, most of the memory banking, most of the zero page placement. Um, they're pretty general purpose devices. They have timers and counters and I.O. registers and the Apple III connects these things to specific, you know, aspects of its hardware. Um, and the way you talk to these are with the addresses uh, FFD something and FFE something. So there are two of them. They, they you know, occupy that, the, you know, those 20 uh, spaces in the, on the um, address bus. I did not, I had no idea even what these, what this was before going into this. So, so that, that is also a, uh, was also a trick to try to figure out <clears throat> how you deal with a 6522, um, what it is, because it, you know, it has sort of a well-defined property. It's not an Apple III thing specifically. The only thing that uh, is Apple III specific is what the, you know, the inputs and outputs and timers are connected to exactly. Um, so, you know, there's one input on this chip that's connected to the keyboard. And so when the keyboard goes, that will generate an interrupt and so forth. Uh, okay. Um, almost all of the information that there is and that I use uh, for this comes out of this Apple III Level 2 Service Reference Manual. Um, it's pretty much the only detailed reference to how all this stuff works. It's pretty informal. I don't think it was even final. It was not available to regular people in the 1980s. It was kind of like semi-internal. <laughs> um, so that, that may have something to do with why nothing was written, because it's there was no way to figure things out. Um, I had to do, spend a lot of time figuring out how all this stuff worked. And again, um, Rob Justice's disassembly of atomic defense was a huge help in this. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll start with starting with the, the screen regions um, and interrupts. So the way the interrupts work, this is again, just general 6502 uh, property. 
FFCD is the interrupt request vector. So um, it, when there's an interrupt request, uh, the processor will jump to there. Will will you know move the move the processing to FFCD and execute whatever's there. Uh, so what you want to put there is jump somewhere. Um, and so if we jump to our own interrupt handler, uh, then we can you know we can sort of deal with the interrupt as it happens. If you're going to do this, you need to save the state and then restore the state because your program is doing something else. And then suddenly you're running the interrupt handler and you want the something else that your program is doing to be able to continue when the interrupt handling is done. So uh, the first thing you need to do is save the save the state and then figure out like what interrupt was called. You know, was it a keyboard? Was it a vertical blank? Whatever. Uh, and then and so you can do you can read uh, FFED. Um, to find out what happened on the EVIA. Um, and then, and if you write there, that'll clear the flag, clear the interrupt flag. Um, the relevant interrupts we have are horizontal blanking, which is 20, vertical blanking, which is 10, keyboard, which is one, and timer, which is two. Um, and most of the numbers that I say are in hexadecimal. So that's 20 hexadecimal. Um, okay, so the thing is, it takes time to save and restore the state. So. Um, Trans, you know, the the transfer uh, x to accumulator, accumulator to x, y to accumulator, accumulator to y. Each of those take the smallest amount of time a 6502 instruction can take, which is two cycles. Uh, push accumulator to the stack is three. Pull accumulator from the stack is four. Return from interrupt is six. Uh, right, so it takes a little while to to get into the interrupt processing. Horizontal blanking occurs every 65 cycles, and you have 25 cycles when the blanking is actually happening. Right, so um, it drew the line, it hit the interrupt, and 25 cycles later, it's going to start drawing again. If it's taking you six cycles just to return from the interrupt, you can see that this is going to be a problem. <laughs> um, it's basically unworkable to just sit there and count horizontal blankings and switch graphics modes whenever you reach the scan line because. Um, by the time you're ready to switch, the blanking is over, um, and you've missed several. So what you can do, though, is that the, the VIA actually can be set up to trigger not on every horizontal blanking, but count a certain number of them and then trigger. So you can say, uh, give me an interrupt every eight horizontal blankings, and that will that will leave you time to like restore the context after switching modes and still leave time to actually like run the game when the interrupt is not being handled so um so that's what i that's what i've done here i've basically i've basically split up the lo the screen into bands of eight and those are the only places where it can switch uh so it's gonna it's gonna come in with an interrupt every eight lines and that and see if it's supposed to be switching modes at that point and if not it'll return to running the game uh okay so the apple 3 runs it's 6502 at two megahertz sort of sometimes. Uh, actually, what it does is it runs at one megahertz whenever the video memory is going out. And uh, that's e that's even, so the processor can be set to either one or two megahertz, but even when it's set to two megahertz, when the video memory is going out, it's running at one. Um, there's 192 lines of video display. They have 65 cycles each. Um, so that's 100, uh, 12,480 cycles while it's drawing the video down. Then the vertical blanking takes the equivalent of 70 lines, which at one megahertz is 4550 cycles. Uh, if it's running at two megahertz, then that's about 9100 cycles. Uh, so what that means is that the 73 percent of the time the Apple III is running at one megahertz, and 27 percent of the time during the vertical blank it's running at two. Uh, so it's not really running at two megahertz much of the time. It, it I think it winds up being something like 1.3 megahertz or something is the is the average, but it's hopping back and forth between the two speeds. Um, the problem is that MAME, the only sort of viable way to em emulate the Apple III at the moment, um, does not emulate the downshift in speed while the video is being drawn. So if you set it to two megahertz in MAME, it's just going to run at two megahertz. Um, so on a, on a real three, you want to shift the video mode between 65 and 80 cycles into the interrupt processing. That'll be during the horizontal blank after the one that triggered the interrupt, right? Um, MAME is going to run twice as fast. It's not going to slow down at that point. And so it's going to get through 130 to 160 cycles in that same, you know, sort of uh, drawing time. So it's very easy, as I 
you know, ask me how I know. Um, it's easy to wind up with something that looks fine in MAME and then gets the screen splits all wrong on the real hardware because the because it's missing horizontal blankings. So um, in order to get something that runs well on both MAME and real hardware, you have to switch fast because they get they they get far apart pretty quickly. And it's also fairly easy to fool yourself into thinking that the game runs fast enough when you're developing it on MAME. Um, so very important to set the next eight line horizontal blanking timer immediately in the handler. So what I did, this this is a picture of the interrupt handler that I have. When you look at this, you think, well, you know, you could you could push stuff to the stack. <laughs> you know, why are you why are you doing this? Or why are you writing to an absolute address? And like I'm, I'm stashing the accumulator in a 16 bit address when I you know, it would be faster. I'd save a cycle if I had stored it in the zero page. Why don't I do that? Uh, because the Apple III can have a repointable zero page in stack. So unlike the Apple II, the Apple II has a zero page at zero. That's a good sort of a sensible place for a zero page. And the stack at 100 immediately next to the zero page. Um, that's that's sort of a standard 6502. You know, that's the way the 6502 operates. But the Apple III allows you to designate any page as the zero page and the stack. Um, so the 6502 can refer to any address in a 64 um, k space using 16 bit addresses, you know, two bytes of addresses. But um, there are two special pages and that's the zero page in the stack. The zero page is, and, you know, there's, there's a special set of faster instructions that can access the zero page because it only takes one byte to, ref to refer to the address. So um, so those are faster. That's the ad uh, advantage of using the zero page addresses. And the stack um, is a last in first out data store that can stash information pretty quickly. It's not it's um, it's not as much faster than storing to absolute addresses as one might like, but it is uh, it's still, you know, it's still fairly quickly one one. It saves um, program space, at least, if not cycles. Uh, OK, so on the Apple III, you can specify which page is the zero page. It doesn't have to be zero. And you can use that to interact fast with like graphics memory, um, which, which I'll get to. Um, but what that also means is that um, I can't, in the interrupt handler, rely on the, you know, putting the, the stack in the zero page being in any place I know. <laughs> so this is the way it works. To, to, um, to set the zero page, you store the value in FFD0 that, that will tell the Apple III what, what to report is the zero page. And then you have a choice about the stack. It can either be adjacent to the zero page, so it's the zero page exclusive or one. So that'll wind up being above the zero page you picked when it's odd, or if the zero page you picked is even, it'll be below. Um, and uh, it could, the other option is you could just have it at 100. So it could either follow the zero page to wherever you sent it, or it could just be at 100 while the zero page is off wherever you said it was gonna be. Um, if the zero page is in video memory, then it's more sensible probably to pick true 100 for the stack because uh, otherwise the alternate stack would also be in video memory. And so um, that keeps you from doing a fair amount of things because uh, like even JSR and RTS uh, mess up the stack. <laughs> so if the stack is on their screen, you will see your screen messed up. Uh, how you choose the stack uh, placement is one of the bits in the environment register at FFDF. Um, so just a quick note about pushing to the screen. Um, so if you want to store a line of A's, you know, A characters in the first text line, which is uh, in memory at 400, um, 400 to 427, then the sort of simplest way to do it would be to, uh, in the in the sort of the, the uh, upper left box there, uh, load the accumulator with A, load X with 27, that's the last column, uh, store that A in 400, index X, decrement X, and then keep going until X rolls off the end. And that, so that'll, um, to do that, that'll take 364 cycles to fill the, fill the line with A's. If you point the zero page at 400, then uh, instead of storing at 400 X, you can store at zero X. So um, the, the box sort of lower middle there, uh, I'm first pointing the zero page at four, um, and I'm counting the cycles for that too, because that seems fair. Then uh, same logic, except instead of storing at 400x, I'm storing at 0x. So instead of taking five cycles to store, it takes four. It repeats and it does that, you know, it saves that one cycle 40 times. Uh, so that, that gets me to 330 cycles. So 
so quicker, 30, 30 ish cycles quicker. Um, and if I wanted to use the stack, um, the the box sort of furthest right there, uh, we can set up set it up so we we point the zero page at five, um, and and pick the alternate stacks, which is going to wind up being at four. And then we use the same the same thing. We um, we load the accumulator with A, we load X with 27, which is the column. We transfer X to the stack pointer. So we're going to start pushing onto the stack at 27. And then we push de push decrement, push decrement, push decrement until it runs off the bottom. And that gets us to 300 cycles, including the setup. So it's quicker. It, you know, if you can, if you can point the stack at the thing you want to fill and it's something easy like that, you can save quite a bit. Um, every, every write is two cycles faster. So uh, anyway, th that's the advantage, and that's one thing that the Apple III can do that the Apple II cannot. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to play around with. Uh, I do use this in various places, um, but what that means is that when an interrupt arrives, I don't know where the stack or zero page are, um, and they might be on the screen. So if I'm going to save the state to the stack, uh, I might just be messing up the screen at the same time. And it would cost me more to, to uh, set the stack and zero page to a known value and then restore them to whatever they were uh, than it would to just use a 16-bit address. Okay. Scrolling. So the Apple III has a um, a hardware support for scrolling pixels vertically. Uh, and I will now describe that. So on the left, I have a, a, a picture of what would you need to do if you wanted to scroll um, basically, uh, what, what is this, 16 lines on an Apple II up one. Right, so 16 high-rise lines, you want to scroll them up one. The way you do that is you, you basically sort of iterate down from the top. Um, you copy line one to line zero. You copy line two to line one, three to line two, four to line three, and so forth. When you get to the bottom, um, you copy the top line, line zero of the next, the next group, uh, up to line seven of the top group, and then you do it again. So copy line one to zero, copy line two to one, three to two, and so forth. So... If you're if you're going to scroll 16 lines on an Apple II, you need to write 16 lines of data. Um, that is, you know, that seems like how could you do better? But here's how you could do better. The um, the Apple III notices this pattern. You know, it, it says, okay, well, if you do this, imagine doing this the Apple II scrolling eight times. So you do it once everything shifts up once. You do it again, everything shifts up again. And eventually, what you wind up with is line, uh, you know, the all of the bottom eight lines have been copied into all of the top eight lines. Um, so what the Apple III allows is basically that for in, in each eight line of uh, each group of eight, you can start at any of them. Um, so if you start at one, it'll draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, zero. So it'll it'll put the it'll draw the zeroth line, but it'll draw it under the seventh. And if you start at two, then it'll do the same thing, except it'll you know draw zero on one at the bottom. And so the the idea is that um, if you're going to take these eight steps anyway, um, you can do them one at a time. So you can just you can just draw one line and scroll up. So we've all we've redrawn is line seven and scrolled up. And next time we'll redraw line six and scroll up two. And Next, redraw line five and scroll up three. And eventually, once you've gone through eight steps, you will have copied the entire bottom block to the entire top block, which you, but you won't have done all the intermediate writes. So that's that's moving much less data. The way this works is there are these soft switches. So if you want to scroll to 010, you hit three COE4, COE3, COE0. That sets the three... Um, you know, the three bits to zero, one, zero, and that'll scroll it up to, right? Uh, so it's, you know, it's clunky, but it's uh, it saves you a lot of time. Uh, it is hard, hard to get your mind around. So I spent a lot of scribbling time on this. Um, it also only functions for high-res display mods. So the, the um, uh, there, there are several different um, soft switches that determine what the display modes are. Um, there's the three here that are relevant, high-res, mix, and graphics text. And those words sound like they mean something, but they don't actually correspond very clearly to what is happening um, here. And that, uh, 
well, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, um, mostly the, the text modes are high res, are not high res and the graphics modes are high res. Um, you would think that the graphics text switch would do that, but no, that is something different. Uh, at any rate, the high res ones are the ones that, that do the, the smooth scrolling. The text ones are not, um, which is a little bit weird because I would have thought that the reason for doing this would be to allow for smoothly scrolling text, but apparently that is not uh, something you can do. MAME, however, does not understand this. Um, so MAME will do it for text modes too, but it scrolls things sideways in a, in a very strange way. Um, real hardware does not do this, but um, it also means that if I want something that's going to run in MAME and on real hardware, I, want, I need to turn off the smooth, smooth scrolling in the non-IRAs regions. Okay. Uh, next bit, custom font. Um, so I, I created a custom font um, for this, uh, the idea being that I would have little little icons that would run around in the middle. The fact that you can change the font is commonly mentioned, um, but not really how. There's a there's a driver um, way that lets you that uh, can do this. So Apple provides a driver. That's pretty much the main way people do it. There's you know a way you can get Business Basic to to do this, but I'm I'm not using drivers. I'm not using Business Basic. I needed to know how this actually worked. The font data doesn't live in addressable space, um, so you can't just like change it. Um, otherwise, that would actually be quite nice, but you can't. Um, you have to stage it into some hidden RAM space. So you you, you put it somewhere and then tell the Apple III to come get it. Um, and uh, it's not really, I don't really know exactly how this works, but it's fairly clearly leveraging the scan through video memory. So the way, you, the way this works is that you put eight characters worth of data into the text page screen holes. And then you turn on the scan font data switch, and then you have to wait for a f at least one full vertical blank cycle. Uh, and then you can move on to the next set of eight characters. You have 128 characters to play with. Um, the other 128 are just the inverse. <coughs> um, screen holes are, um, if you don't know, uh, on the text page, every triplet of lines on the text page has a screen hole on the edge, and that's because the text line is, is uh, 40 characters wide. But every um, 128 byte boundary is lined up on the left edge. So the first line goes from 0 to 39, now to speaking decimal for some reason. Um, second line goes from 40 to 79. The third line goes from 80 to 119. And the next thing we do needs to line up with 128, which means that 120 through 127 are not used for anything. Those are the screen holes. They're not displayed anywhere. They're, they're in the text memory space, but they're not displayed. Um, we have uh, we have eight of those. And, uh, and each of those eight screen holes has eight bytes in it. So we have 64 bytes free. Um, and whatever you write in here, it doesn't affect the screen data. So that's that's where you put the font data. You, you put the font data there, and then you tell the Apple III to come get it. Okay, uh, fonts are seven by eight, right? And again, we throw away the high bit, um, so it's seven across, eight down. You would think a sensible way to do this would be that each screen hole would contain the data for one character. That's eight. It's eight bytes long. Font data is eight bytes tall. Uh, or, failing that, uh, that they would be organized down the screen. You know, so with the eighth byte has the, you know, all the all the eighth byte of each of the screen hall is the data for the eighth character. Seventh byte is the data for the seventh and so forth. Um, that would make sense. Uh, it is neither of these things. Um, and not only is it neither of those things, I did not find this information written down anywhere. Um, the monitor ROM does set up the characters when it boots, but um, it uses a compressed data that it's you know, it's very hard to understand like what the data is because it's, it's all in, um, compressed into smaller space. So... I basically figured this out through trial and error, but um, in fact, uh, the font data layout is each screen hole contains two bytes of four different characters. Um, the first four screen holes contain the first four characters, and the last four screen holes contain the last four characters, because Apple can always find a way to interleave things just one more level. Um, there are screen holes in page two, and they uh, are also used. They contain the character number. Right, so the data, the character data, pixel data is in screen one. The character number is in screen two. So if you're updating character one, you have to put eight ones 
in the page two addresses that correspond to the eight addresses holding the pixel data in page one. Anyway, okay, so um, the way the way this works is you put the data in the screen hole, you touch C0DB to turn on the font trace transfer. You wait for a full VBL cycle, which usually means waiting for two interrupts. You know, the first interrupt will happen after an incomplete one. Uh, and then you touch C0DA to turn off the font transfer. And uh, okay, it's often mentioned uh, with very little information of how it works that the Apple III has a 6-bit audio DAC. The way this works is that uh, PB... PB, port B of the EVIA, um, it's accessed by FFE0. And what that tells us is that the lower six bits of what you write to FFE0 go to the DAC. I don't know what an audio DAC is supposed to be. At least I didn't before this came, before I started this project. And in fact, now I'm not even sure that I do completely know. But anyway, um, what are these six bits encoding? It seems to me like what they're encoding is essentially an amplitude. Um, and at least it seems to work when I treat it like that. So what that would mean is if you want to produce a sine wave, then um, you just raise its value up and down <clears throat> in a sinusoidal pattern. And if you do that repeatedly, the frequency will dictate the pitch. So uh, the document that I showed on the previous slide um, says there are 127 different possible tone combinations, but I can only count to 64 with six bits. So I, it's a typo, I don't know. Um, or maybe I still am not understanding something about how, what those six bits do, but in any event, um, the basics of running the audio is pretty simple. You just put the amplitude in that audio register. Um, if you wanna have a, a reasonable pitch and smooth sounding audio though, you have to do it often and regularly. And, you know, this is great. We have an Apple III. It has interrupts. We can just set it, you know, say, interrupt me at the time that I want the audio to go, and I will provide the audio. Seems great. Uh, turns out, though, uh, not that easy. So here's a, this, there's an article on in On3 um, by Al Evans that talks a little bit about this. That was one of, a, one of his columns. And he was trying to do basically exactly this. He was trying to use... Uh, interrupt-driven audio in a game context. But uh, what he observed was that uh, the, the minimum response time to call an interrupt handler is about 160 microseconds, and then another 115 is required to return. It's possible that that's not actually as good as you can get because that um, may be running everything through sauce. We are bypassing sauce here, but the point is still the same. Uh, it takes so long to run, to get in and out of the interrupt handler that uh, even if the you know super quick to like actually update the DAC, um, uh, you're going to spend all your time going in and out of the audio handler. You, and you know you're not going to be able to get a very high frequency, but you're also not going to have any time to like run the rest of your game. <laughs> so, um, so he gave up. Uh, you know the guy who wrote um, Captain Magneto gave up. Said this is beyond me. Um, Turns out, though, I, ha I have I have something I can do, um, you know, to sort of factor out that that in and out uh, issue, which is that I already have a horizontal blank interrupt firing several times a frame, and so I'm gonna just piggyback the audio on that um, since since that's happening all the time anyway, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, you know, I can I can just say you know also transfer the audio as I'm checking to switch the mode. Uh, originally, I had it firing the horizontal blank firing actually only whenever I needed a mode switch, so it would go like ten lines and then twenty and then ten and then. Um, but um, for the audio, we really wanted to fire it more regularly than that, so I so I've changed it so that it fires every eight and whether it needs to switch or not, and it will you know do very little if it doesn't have to switch. Um, one thing this doesn't account for is the vertical blank. Um, there would be, there should be about eight or nine audio samples pushed out during the time of the, the vertical blank, and it it actually really does sound pretty bad if you don't do that, at least on real hardware. So uh, what I what I did to account for that is that when the vertical blank is happening, I set up a just a timer that goes off at a, about the same rate, so that it should get us. Um, somewhere between eight and nine audio samples during the vertical blank before it comes back. Um, this is sort of, this is the kind of thing that could always be more finished. Um, it's not bug-free yet. Uh, 
sometimes it will crash if you're traveling downward and occasionally, uh, particularly on real hardware, um, the audio sound effects will overpower the mode switching and uh, get the screen to display garbage. Um, there's not currently a way to win or lose. Uh, the hoarders are supposed to head for the disc that's closest to them, but it's not clear that they do that. Um, actually, I think they're supposed to head for the most valuable disc that's closest to them. Um, but I need to get that to work in order to allow dropping a distractor disc to work. Um, the map may be too large to be fun, so it's possible that I should have levels and start it with smaller. And it would be nice to think of something to do with the lower medium resolution region. Um, right now it just shows a grassy pattern. Um, I couldn't think of a good thing to do with it. Uh, it's a very busy screen though, um, because it's a tech demo. I mean, it wasn't really designed to be like, what's the most fun game I can write? <laughs> um, so I wanted to have you know, super high res at the top, medium res at the bottom, but uh, I don't have anything to display there. So uh, anyway, so that is it. Um, the code will be available on GitHub to look at. Uh, it'll be under my GitHub account somewhere. Uh, and I'm going to try to see if the MAME in a browser on the Internet Archive will run this. I don't know if Apple 3 emulation works there or not, but if it does, then that would be kind of cool. I could at least play it in the browser. Um, and I guess part of the point of doing this was to provide an example of how these technologies could be used to help future others or future me um, by at least having something that sort of shows how it can be done so not everyone needs to keep banging their heads against the level two reference manual. Okay, anyway, that's that's good enough. I will leave it here and uh, toss to me on Zoom, so. Okay, uh, so I have, uh, I guess, a couple of um, moments for questions and I, I see a couple of questions here in the in the Zoom Q&A, so I'll, I'll I'll do these. Um, so Charles asked, uh, are there any advantages of the three um, that are possible to add to a two with uh, add-on hardware, like a, a mouse card? Um, I do not know. Um, the I So what's happening with the, the memory stuff with the three is probably, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not super clear on what hardware can do, but I mean, like what, what it's mostly doing is it's watching, it's like sort of what the bit HD does, I suppose. It's it's like watching what the CPU is doing. Um, and, you know, so if the CPU says, uh, I want something in the zero page, then the uh, Apple III says, oh, you mean, you know, something in page 1A, um, and, then, and then hands it to that. So um, I don't know if a card can do that, but it might be able to. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the kind of thing uh, yeah, maybe, maybe the answer is probably maybe. Um, and Jeremy asked in the in the Q and A also. Um, okay, so this, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, so, doesn't an arriving interrupt write information on the stack regardless? I believe the chip pushes some state to the stack before jumping to the handler. Uh, if you have the stack, if you have the stack mapped to the screen, doesn't it get corrupted by the interrupt itself, and uh, or does the Apple III do something about that? Um, I th that is true. I only just um, that only just kind of occurred to me sort of late, um, but I think it does push the flags to the stack before processing the interrupt because oh, I don't have to save. Like I can freely use carry, uh, but um, I don't have to save that and restore it. Uh, so. Um, I don't know. It's a that is a really interesting question. It may well be that um, the Apple III will will corrupt the graphics page um, when you hit the interrupt. I uh, I haven't gotten close enough to bug free to know it, like if that is the bug that I'm seeing. Um, but uh, I do think that I'm using it sort of off label. Um, so like I I don't think you're supposed to point the stack into the into the zero page um, or into the graphics pages. I mean so. Um, I think they were expecting it always to be, you know, somewhere between like 18 and 1F. Um, so uh, it might be that they don't do anything about that, and in which case it's probably better to, to, you know, again better to put the stack at 100 or or very quickly, uh, like maybe turn off interrupts if you ever move the stack away. Um, so yeah. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought through the implications of that, but that, that is correct that I think there's a possible conflict between using the stack in graphics memory and having these interrupt processing processings. Uh, okay, let's see. I think um, I do. I've been following along a little bit in the Discord um, channel for this. Uh, the and and I've also posted the place where I put this on GitHub um, on 
in in that channel but it's um it's at my github account and it's called disk hero is the the final bit of the url um i'll leave it at that because i'm basically out of time 